Welcome and thank you for standing by. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. All participants are in listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. At that time, you may press star one to ask a question. I would now like to turn the call over to Josh Finch. Thanks, you may begin. Good evening and welcome. Thanks for joining us today for our media teleconference from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Josh Finch with NASA's Office of Communications. We're here to discuss NASA's Boeing Orbital Flight Test 2 mission, the second uncrewed flight test of the CST-100 Starliner spacecraft on an Atlas V rocket to the International Space Station as a part of NASA's commercial crew program. Teams from NASA and Boeing just completed the flight readiness review for the mission, and representatives are here to talk more about this important review. Today we have Kathy Leaders, Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations at NASA, Steve Stitch, Manager of NASA's Commercial Crew Program, Joel Montalbano, Manager, NASA's International Space Station Program, John Vollmer, Vice President and Program Manager at Boeing's Commercial Crew Program, and Norm Knight, Director, NASA's Flight Operations Directorate. We're going to begin with opening comments from our speakers and then open it up for your questions. To get into the queue, you can press star one on your phone. And with that, we'll begin with comments from Kathy. So thank you for being here. You know, yesterday was the 10th anniversary of the shuttle retirement. And um, at least a few of us here in the room today had been working at that time on a team that had, had started to lay kind of the seeds that some of that growth is now showing up now today through this Starliner development. And so um, I just want to reflect on and, and while you're sitting in flight readiness reviews, it's really a time of reflection because you sit here and you think about all the work that these teams have done. I mean, in some ways as you're, as people go through all the different areas and the things that they've been working on, it's just this testimony of, you know, where people have spent years to get to this moment. And so, Today we conducted our flight test readiness review for the reflight of the Boeing Starliner uncrewed demonstration mission and we've officially set that launch date for July 30th. Um, these are very important reviews where the station and the commercial crew and the Boeing teams really stop and scrutinize the work that they have done to get ready for this flight. And so we're here with our counterparts and our international partners and sitting carefully and making sure that we're ready to go. Um, the team presented their detailed readiness, which also included all their lessons learned from the independent review team that was conducted after OFT-1 and went through all their corrective actions very carefully that both the Boeing and NASA teams had done and, and reviewed their, all their they're the work that had been done to close out all those actions. So after reviewing the team's data and the readiness of all the parties, um, everybody said go for the launch today um, and moving out for the mission. Um, just, it was, a, it was an incredibly detailed review and, and, and the team um, really showed all that work that they had done to get us here. So to me, this review was a reflection of the diligence and the passion of this Boeing and NASA team that really chose to learn and adapt and come back stronger for this uncrewed demonstration mission. So I'm really looking forward to the launch next week and the mission to station and getting some work done for Joel for a little bit and uh, coming back home safely and uh, then moving on to crewed flight. Thank you. Let's see, uh, as Kathy said, uh, I, I was one of those individuals, this is Steve Stitch, the commercial crew program manager, and I was one of those individuals back at the end of shuttle that was sort of laying out the framework for how we would go uh, operate this program and what the requirements would be and it's pretty exciting to be here today to think about uh, where we've come from from those days where we were trying to figure out what the requirements were and how we would implement the program to today where this, uh, yesterday we moved the Crew 2 vehicle. We had Shane, Megan, Aki and Toma move the Crew 2 vehicle from the Node 2 forward port to the Zenith port 
to make room for the, for the Starliner flight. That was very exciting. And then participating in the flight readiness review today was another exciting moment. Uh, the review was very thorough today. We went through a lot of the aspects of the flight. Uh, we talked about uh, some of the, the issues we had on the last flight with the flight software, with the launch time, uh, the service module, the CM disposal uh, issues, and also the COM anomalies. We went through those in a lot of detail. We talked today at the review about the independent review team that uh, NASA and Boeing formed together, how we closed out the, the actions. There were 61 for the flight software, uh, 19 for the communication system. So those have been closed out uh, as we move forward. Uh, we also talked about the, the importance of this flight. If I look forward to flying crew, very important for the commercial crew program to have two tra space transportation systems. This will be the second of those. Uh, and we talked about that this vehicle really is very close to a crewed vehicle, and I know John Bulmer will talk more about that. The Atlas launch vehicle will fly on OFT2. It's exactly the same configuration we'll fly the crew on. We'll have aborts enabled for the first time on this, uh, on this mission, and the service module uh, associated with Starliner has the launch abort engine, so it's important to have that active for the flight. Um, you know, we're looking toward the launch opportunity. Right now, the launch opportunity we're targeting as we set today, uh, July 30th, it's 2.53 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time is the launch time. Uh, we, we would dock about 24 hours later uh, on that Saturday, the 31st of July, and, and then we would, uh, we would work toward an undocking uh, on uh, August the 5th and, and landing that same day. So it's a, a relatively short flight plan, but we'll take the time that we need to when we get there. The primary landing site would be the White Sands Space Harbor, and, uh, and then we have a lot of activities planned during the flight. Really, this flight, um, one of the important systems we'll test is the, the rendezvous and docking system. We'll talk, test the NASA docking system. We'll test the rendezvous sensor system. Those things you can test on the ground uh, in analysis and in uh, testing in simulators, but uh, at some point you've got to go fly those systems, and that's the, one of the important aspects of this flight is testing the rendezvous and docking, staying docked to station. We'll test the audio system while we're docked to station and, and a few other objectives. And we're really looking forward to this flight from a commercial crew perspective. Uh, it's really an honor to be a part of the team. You know, over the last 18 months, the Boeing and NASA team have worked side by side to uh, resolve numerous issues, to go through and close out requirements, and you know we're really ready to go fly now, so it's an exciting time. And when I look forward to a crewed flight, this, this mission is really the key to crewed flight, as we talked about as soon as later this year, uh, getting these systems tested on this test flight and then uh, setting us up for the crewed flight later this year. And now I'll turn it over to Joel Montabano from the Space Station Program. Hey, thank you, Steve, and, and welcome again to today's press brief. Uh, we continue to have a very busy summer on board the International Space Station with multiple missions coming and going, and we're constantly reviewing the flight plan to make sure we're maximizing the capabilities of the International Space Station. With seven people on board, three Americans, one Japanese agency astronaut, one European space agency astronaut, and two Russian cosmonauts. So we have an opportunity on board to maximize research and utilization, maximize the technology development that we can do for the lunar program, and then continue our LEO commercialization efforts. From an ISS uh, status standpoint, the ISS is in really good shape. The two new recently installed solar arrays are generating power and, and operating nominally, um, and that at the completion of the three EVAs uh, we did uh, last month. Like uh, Steve and Kathy said, we've had a number of reviews to prepare for the OFT2 mission, and while we have some standard work to go, the International Space Station team is ready, and we're looking forward to the Starliner vehicle and the continuation of the commercial crew program. Uh, this vehicle is carrying about 200 kilograms of pressurized cargo to ISS and returning about 260 kilograms from ISS. Uh, as Steve said, the vehicle will just stay a few days, and we look forward to having two crewed vehicles on board ISS for the very first time. Uh, with this mission, we're increasing the robustness of the ISS program by getting the agency closer to another certified crew provider, which allows the space station team and the agency and the, the, the international partnership to further the activities we do on board the space station. 
Um, we continue, this partnership continues 20 plus years of continuous human presence on board the International Space Station. And our partnership with commercial industry is changing history by opening up low Earth orbit to more people, more science, and more commercial opportunities. So on that, a huge thanks to the commercial crew program, the Boeing team for getting us to where we are today. Uh, we are a solid ecosystem. We're ready to go, and we're looking forward to this mission. Over to you, John. Thank you, Joel. <clears throat> so first of all, it's a, an honor and a privilege to be here today. This is certainly a very exciting time for the Boeing Company, and uh, we, we understand it comes with some awesome responsibilities. Uh, we understand it's paramount that we ensure the safety of the International Space Station, its crew, and that we accomplish our mission of test objectives, return our vehicle safely to Earth, and do so in a manner that uh, ensures public safety as well. Uh, to that end, the Boeing team has worked tirelessly with NASA to look at all aspects of readiness to accomplish this mission and ensure we have the safest vehicle possible. Uh, over the past 18 months, uh, we've worked through the pandemic. We've had numerous weather issues and other challenges, but this NASA Boeing team has um, taken an exhaustive look at our processes, tools, and uh, products. Uh, I think one of the biggest areas we focused on has been the hardware-software integration. And, and I use the, the term hardware-software integration versus software because we really looked at the integration of that software into the overall product, uh, how it worked with our subsystems, and the end-to-end -end performance. Um, so that was one area of focus. We also have spent a great deal of effort to configure this vehicle, as Steve mentioned, as close as possible to the crewed configuration. Uh, one, to reduce risk, and two, to leverage as much testing as possible on this flight. Uh, an example that was mentioned was the uh, full abort capability that we had. Uh, on the first OFT mission, uh, we had mass simulators. Uh, we elected to put the full abort system in, and it will be active through all phases of flight. Uh, we also incorporated some uh, crew displays and some numerous minor design changes, uh, grounding heaters, sensors, wiring, uh, but all to make this vehicle as close as possible to the, the, the crewed flight vehicle. Uh, right now, the uh, Starliner vehicle is uh, fully integrated with the Atlas V in the uh, vertical integration facility. Uh, yesterday, we completed our end-to-end -end testing uh, and that was primarily our communications testing with the TDR system and verified our communication with mission control. Uh, today we completed all of the testing with the Atlas vehicle to ensure all the interfaces uh, are functional and operate as expected. Uh, and all are healthy and communicating as, as we expected. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud of this, uh, this NASA, Boeing, and ULA team. Uh, I know this clean flight readiness review we had today and, and heading into the week was uh, really due to the hard work and dedication of, of all the teams that participated. Um, this isn't the first day we've been working on readiness. So we have been literally working on this for months and months. And so this is really the culmination of a lot of hard work by all the teams. Uh, we've been uh, keeping Butch, Nicole, and Mike in the loop frequently as uh, we progress toward this flight to make sure that we are looking at their inputs uh, toward our crewed flight vehicle, which will occur after this. And um, I'd also like to emphasize that uh, we are working very closely with our flight and mission ops. Uh, they were instrumental in our success on the first OFT mission and uh, they will be integral to our success as we fly this flight as well. Uh, because this is a, a test flight, uh, we, are, we will have an objective of really listening to our hardware and understanding what the hardware is trying to tell us uh, so that we can ensure that we incorporate that learning into our next flight and that we've got uh, the safest vehicle possible. So once again, it's a privilege to be here, and we are ready to fly. Uh, Norm, over to you. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, John. You know, great review today, like everyone said, and, and we're clearly satisfied that the, you know, the objective of keeping the ISS crew safe, their vehicles safe, and achieving the mission objectives of OFT2 
uh, have been satisfied with this review, so it was really great. Uh, Kathy started the meeting this morning um, and allowed the uh, CFT crew, uh, Butch Wilmore, Nicole Mann, and Mike Fink, to, to come in and, and just briefly uh, say hello to the team and thank them and really provide some focus that, you know, this mission, OFT2, is the precursor for putting crew on the vehicle. So it, it really uh, provided a good frame of uh, reference and mental attitude for the team uh, as, you know, they started and participated in the review today. Uh, OFT2 is important, obviously, because it's a, the first end-to-end -end checkout from pre-launch to docking to undocking to post-landing uh, that we get, and that, uh, that's what buys down the risk and makes it safe for uh, putting crew on the vehicle after a uh, successful test flight. Uh, while this crew does not have, or while this mission, while this mission does not have crew, uh, the CFT astronauts have been uh, intimately involved, working side by side, the uh, Boeing and ULA teams uh, as they progress to this point. You know, as John said yesterday, during some vehicle comp checks and checkouts, uh, the, the uh, CFT team was right alongside, and that's great. It builds trust, builds camaraderie and again, just keeps the focus on that the next step is crew. Tomorrow is a uh, mission uh, dress rehearsal uh, for OFT2. The crew will be in uh, the Boeing uh, Mission Control Center over here uh, in Florida, and so they'll be watching uh, the engineering team go through some of the pre-launch activities, and then of course listening in uh, to the collective efforts as the Houston uh, and Florida teams work together uh, to simulate and count down to, uh, to launch. You know, space flight's hard. It is uh, definitely not easy. And I'll just tell you that the uh, crew greatly appreciates the effort by NASA, Boeing, and the ULA partnership for safe space flight uh, for our astronauts. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Josh. Thank you, Norm. Uh, we'll now start taking questions over the phone. As a reminder, please press star one to get into the queue. And we'll take our first question from Irene Klotz at Aviation Week. Thanks so much. Um, I wanted to know, first of all, what the uh, time period um, for getting OFT2 uh, airborne is and if that's dependent on the um, successful docking of the Russian uh, research module that launched, um, I lost track of days, I think it was yesterday. Um, and uh, just what other beta cutouts or ISS operational issues are going on that could affect the uh, schedule for OFT2. Thanks. This is Joel. I'll, I'll start and then people can add. Um, we've been working with Roscosmos to uh, set up that um, the choreography and uh, we have it set up such that uh, the MLM would dock on the 29th and then that would open us up for a launch on the 30th. Um, so all that work is done. Uh, we still, as you know, had an MLM launch yesterday. We'll have a, a progress on dock, taking away the, the docking compartment, um, and we still have that in front of us. But um, all that has been timelined with the flight control team, and, and we're ready to go. I don't know, Steve, if you want anything? Yeah, I would say right now, there's Irene, there's no uh, no beta cutouts or anything like that. Uh, we, we can go fly in this time frame. You know, we have the 30th of July as the prime launch opportunity. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a range conflict on July 31st, and... So the next opportunity would be uh, on August the 3rd uh, when the trajectory is favorable for another uh, opportunity. But we'll work closely with, with the ISS program and Joel uh, as things evolve. As Joel said, right now the plan is for MLM to dock on the 29th, well ahead of our launch on the 30th. Okay, so just to clarify, does MLM need to be docked before OFT2 would launch? It does not. We can uh, we can support the OFT docking with or without the MLM. And our next question is from Jeff Faust at Space News. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, you talked about um, doing a crew flight test as soon as later this year. Uh, assuming OFT two goes as planned and there are no issues with it, can you be more specific at as the earliest possible date? for crew flight tests based on the work you would need to do to prepare for that mission as well as the visiting vehicle schedule for the ISS. Thanks. Yeah, right, right now, you know, we, we don't have an exact date planned for the crew flight test. I think the most important thing, the thing that the Boeing and NASA team have been focused on in the near term is, 
is the execution of the orbital flight test. Uh, that has been our primary focus. Uh, what we'll do is go execute this flight, work our way down through the launch countdown, and uh, get, get the vehicle launched and then safely on orbit. Um, then we'll execute the demonstration objectives and we'll work through all those things for a, a new vehicle coming to ISS and get docked and, and land. And then we have a post-flight time frame where we'll assess uh, uh, how the vehicle performed and we'll look at that. And then, you know, later on we'll then start solidifying uh, what the crewed flight test date is. But we, we don't have a specific date in mind. Uh, it looks like right now, by, by the end of the year, would be supportable. But again, we really need to focus on the orbit flight test first and get that flight right. As a reminder, if you have a question uh, for the any of the panel, please press star one on your phone. Our next question will go to Michael Maidenberg at the Wall Street Journal. Hi, good evening. Um, could someone from NASA describe just with a little more detail, some of the steps, reviews, efforts it took to, you know, provide oversight over, over Boeing um, and how it's um, carrying out its end of this, this flight. And Mr. Vollmer, at, at Boeing's end, like, what, what did the company do differently, you know, this time around in the run-up uh, compared to last time? Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the I'll take the first part, and then I'll let John respond as well. So, you know, NASA has a pretty standard process of getting ready for these flights, where we have a series of data deliveries that Boeing provides to us, and we go through and analyze uh, all the information provided for Boeing. In many cases, we do an independent analysis or assessment of that, and uh, and approve our, all, each one of those products. In, in particular, for the uh, independent review team and the flight software actions. Uh, we had a, a team uh, from NASA kind of embedded with the Boeing team uh, looking at all of their changes to the flight software, the changes to their flight software process. Uh, I would say, uh, echo what John said, what, what they have focused on is hardware software integration in, in facilities in Houston where they can test the avionics system and the flight software together. They can inject faults. They can fail flight computers and avionics components. We've set uh, through all those runs side by side uh, with John and his team and reviewed uh, the progress of each of those tests. Uh, the Boeing team also went through a, a very extensive mission rehearsal where they, uh, in the hardware software integration facility, starting with launch all the way through docking and undocking, we participated in that activity and, and reviewed all those results side by side with, uh, with John and his team. So I think that gives you a little flavor of, of how we work uh, items side by side plus the standard reviews that you have with our stage operations readiness review with the station program and all the culmination of that. Plus there's on the commercial crew program side, there's the detailed flight test readiness review that they conduct too. So, so both mm -hmm. programs along with the Boeing folks obviously, and John can talk about this in a little bit, having all their internal reviews. Today was really the culmination of all those from a NASA perspective where both programs and Boeing came in and really talked through all the remaining work, which all there was was really non-standard -stand open work. Let me clarify that, standard open work. <laughs> all, and, and so a very clean review for us heading into and, and really what ensured us all being go today um, for the flight next week. So like Steve said, there's obviously a lot of work being done at lower levels and then both programs have a very standard review process that they go make sure that all their the verification activities and um, analysis work that needs to be done to be able to close out their requirements for each of the programs is closed out and then at the agency level we also close out. Sorry, thanks. Okay, hey, this is John Walmer. Uh, some of the things we did different for this flight, and, and I, you'll hear some echoing of, of what Steve Stitch said because we're obviously working close together, but um, we did look at the IRT. Uh, we looked at all of those items that coming at, coming out of it. There was a big portion of those items which were process related. So we went and looked at our processes. Uh, we institutionalized uh, our responses to those processes so that we incorporated the learning from that into our processes. Uh, one of the big things was peer reviews. 
Uh, we ensured that we had our subsystem uh, responsible engineers as we went through our, our software flight test, that they were integral to uh, the testing throughout all phases. So as we looked at the requirements, we brought the responsible engineer to make sure that they concurred that was the right requirement. We, looked, we then went on and looked at, okay, so what's the, uh, the, the design solution for that requirement? We had the responsible engineer come in and agree that looks like the right design solution. We got into the test requirements and look at the test. Does this look like the right test? Uh, all the way through the life cycle until we got through the final test and made sure that, in fact, are these are the results you expected from the requirement that we started with. And so that was um, a fundamental uh, change to how we were doing things, um, and, we, and we formalized how we, how we did that. Um, the other thing that we did was outside of the IRT, which drove a lot of things, was we introduced the uh, ASIL mission rehearsal. Um, the ASIL mission rehearsal was an extensive review of an end-to-end -end look at the software uh, scenarios from beginning of flight through the end of flight. And as part of that process, we tied in Mission Control Center both in Houston uh, and in Florida and we tied in our ULA partners as well. So we truly had an integrated mission rehearsal, simulated mission uh, from end to end that we ran, uh, and we got a lot of learning out of that. Uh, so that was uh, something we introduced uh, that was different from the last flight. And, and the other thing I'd like to talk about is, as we strengthened our IVNV, our Independent Verification and Validation Program, so we brought on an independent contractor. We had them report up through an independent path through the Boeing company uh, to take a, another set of eyes to look at all of our work and ensure uh, that they didn't see anything that was out of line or needed to be addressed. Uh, they were actually very helpful. Uh, we invited NASA to participate in that as well. Uh, they came up with uh, observations and findings. Uh, they brought those into the team environment, and the team worked through all of those. So those were some of the, the fundamental changes that you're asking about. And our next question is from Bill Harwood at CBS News. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, Steve, just to follow up on Jeff South's question, I don't know that anybody was looking for a specific date, but can you at least ballpark CFT for us? I mean, with JWST and Artemis One and CFT, I mean, you know, some of us might spontaneously combust before this is all over. I'm just trying to get a sense of when, uh, you know, October, November, December, you, you guys might be planning to do this. And, and a quick follow-up, since I've got the line, um, since the abort system is going to be hot for this flight, uh, will the uh, the group that, I guess they used to be called Attachment 3, will those guys be doing any kind of rehearsing uh, since you're going to go ahead and fly this mission? Thanks. Yeah, I, I would say, Bill, I, boy, I would love to give you a date, but I just, we just aren't that far along. You know, again, I, we, we've been really working hard on OFT2 and CFT and the crewed flight test. And as John said, this vehicle is very representative of the crewed vehicle. It's almost identical. And we've been focused on this flight. Um, so we just really don't have, we really need to sit down after the flight is over. We need to review all the data and then sit down with the ISS schedule and then figure out a date. So I just really can't provide that uh, today. In, in terms of the Detachment 3, um, you know, they will be there for the crewed flight test and we'll be participating. They are, they are not part of this flight, the uh, test, this orbit flight test. So. Um, so they're really not participating, but but they are ready. They are trained. They have uh, uh, tested their procedures uh, in off the Atlantic here in the tidal basin and also in Houston as well. So thank you. And then figure out a day. So I just really can't provide that today. And we'd like to make sure that everyone, uh, if you're not speaking, has their mic muted. Thanks. And our next question will go to Joe Roulette at The Verge. Hey, thank you. Um, question for John Vollmer. Um, I, in light of, uh, you know, a, a, a few years of, you know, setbacks that Boeing has faced either on its commercial airplane side or, or you know, the space unit side, um, I was just kind of wanted to get you to speak a little bit more about how kind of crucial this 
Starliner mission is going to be for the, for Boeing space program. Um, you know, what will it signal to to you know the public, and, and kind of how important is it for the Starliner teams that are working on it? Um, and then I had another question for uh, Kathy um, or Steve. If you guys could just summarize real quick uh, the changes in oversight um, and, and how you guys uh, verified and validated Boeing's um, software and other systems this time around, as opposed to um, before OFT1. Uh, thanks. Okay, hey Joel, this is John Ballmer. So, from a standpoint of how important is this to the Boeing company, so this is extremely important. Um, this is a this is a serious and unforgiving business, right? So we take it very seriously. Um, uh, it's extremely important to us that we're successful on this flight. We have. All that we've done over the past 18 months, we are very confident that we are going to have a good flight. Will there be some learning? There'll absolutely be some learning during this flight. Uh, it is a test flight, and so the intent is is that uh, we want to go fly this vehicle. There are systems on this uh, vehicle that we need to uh, uh, fully understand how they operate in the environment of space. Um, so we will be monitoring those systems. We'll be collecting the learning from those systems so that we can incorporate that in uh, and, and help us uh, build a, the safest vehicle we can for the crew flights. Uh, so it, it's, um, it, it's of paramount importance that uh, uh, we have a successful flight. Now, having said that, um, we are committed to flying out um, our missions with NASA. And so um, this is but yet another stepping stone on our path to do that. And I would echo what John said. The flight is extremely important to the commercial crew program as well. We, we would like to bring online a second space transportation system to the International Space Station. This flight is hugely important to us as well. And so we have been side by side with John as we go through each of the aspects of flight readiness. Um, in terms of what we did to strengthen uh, our approach to the flight software and the hardware software integration, you know, we added some expertise on our team uh, and strengthened the, the depth of the team uh, with hardware software integration experts, software experts to help better understand uh, the changes to the software, the changes to the processes and reviewed each of those. We then went in also and looked at uh, the hazard reports and any controls in the hazard reports that dealt with the flight software or how the flight software talked to the avionics system and we strengthened that team. We made sure we went and reviewed um, all the um, uh, interface control documents that, that Boeing has uh, with the hardware software. We, we looked at those. We also, as John said earlier, we are a strong participant in the independent validation uh, and verification of the software. We review uh, those software test reports and we dig into any uh, particular uh, findings that might be in those reports. Um, so we really did beef up our software team. Uh, we realized how important it was uh, to the success of this mission, and so we've been side by side with Boeing through all the testing that John has talked about in, the, in their um, hardware software simulation lab called ASIL and the mission rehearsal that, that they went through as well. And our next question is from Rachel Nail at Florida Today. Hey there, this question is for Kathy. Kathy, you talked about um, the flight readiness review being a time of reflection. I'm curious when you reflect on the last, you know, 17, 18 months, all this hard work you guys have done, what were the really hard moments? What were the good moments? And, and did, you, did you doubt you'd ever get to this day? First, I never doubted we would get to this day. Um, you know, when you look at this team, and I will tell you, I, you know, was at the launch. We were in the ASOC, you know, 18 months ago, and um, and the flight control team that really saved the vehicle that day did a phenomenal job. And I remember I walked out of the ASOC, drove in my car over to the Boeing, Mission Control Center area and walked in and there was a team in there that was diligently working to get as much data from that flight as they could so that and to get that vehicle back and it was a joint NASA Boeing team 
that was working to get that vehicle back so that we could do this again. We've been getting ready to do this again since December 2019. And so it was just about when are we ready to do it? And I am so incredibly proud of this team that they have not hurried. <laughs> they have taken their time. They've made sure that they went through and and checked the progress and decided when to go fly. And now's the right time. Today we decided now's the right time. This team's ready to go. This vehicle's ready to go. And we need to go take this learning that we we got a lot of learning from that first demonstration mission. Um, and we've rolled that all into our learning on this demonstration mission. And we'll learn, we'll learn from this mission and we'll roll it in and go fly our crewed flight test. But I never doubted this team. And our next question is from Hanukkah Wittering at space.com. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I'm just wondering, compared to OFT-1, have there been any changes in the planned flight profile or the exact timeline of events from launch to docking? And also, how will it uh, compare to the future crewed flights? Thanks. Hey, this is John Vollmer. I'll take that one. So the uh, trajectory is going to be very, very similar to what we did on OFT-1. We do have a maneuver that we will be performing uh, shortly after separation, and that will be to point one of our antennas uh, to ensure that we have good communications. Um, the rest of our mission profile will be uh, nearly identical to what we flew, uh, we're planned to fly on the OFT-1 mission. So we'll be looking forward to um, going through and completing our demonstrations. Uh, so we will, uh, after the orbital insertion burn, we will go forward uh, we will do our, our several burns to get us in a uh, inclination to uh, get in proximity to station. Uh, from there, we will um, we'll do some demonstrations of the vehicle performance and navigation performance. Uh, and then once we get the, the, the safety go from station, we will uh, enter an orbit uh, that gets us close to uh, a docking. That will be one of our major objectives. Uh, so we will do an approach, uh, we'll back out, and then we will, once given to go, we will come in and uh, uh, complete docking, uh, and then we'll go through the rest of the docking event and then undock after our operations on station. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your phone to enter the queue. Our next question will be from Emily Speck at WKMG. Hey guys, um, this question is for Joel or anyone who can answer. Can you talk about any of the cargo going up on Starliner? What kind of supplies are in those 400 pounds? And then I also wanted to know with COVID cases back on the rise, have there been any recent virus related issues preparing for launch? Thank you. All right, from a cargo standpoint, uh, we're going to be bringing up things like uh, food for the crews, clothes, hygiene items. Uh, on the way home, we're bringing home some. Uh, we'll bring home some science hardware. We're also bringing home some um, air tanks that we've had on board that we've used. Um, we've depleted the air on board. We'll bring the tanks home, refurb them, and, and fly again. Um, as far as COVID cases, uh, uh, you know, we 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 continue to track that. Um, I'll tell you, um, being from the at the Houston Center. It's been pretty good in, in our area on the COVID cases. Uh, while we still have the, the constraints in place, um, it's, the COVID really hasn't um, negatively affected us. So we've learned how to, to work remotely, and, 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 and we're in the process of trying to you know, continue those operations through the lessons learned. Uh, but from, our, from an ISS standpoint, uh, the control centers have been, been rocking and rolling um, across the globe, not only in Houston, but at the other control centers as well. And of course, today at the flight readiness review, this is Steve Stitch. We wore masks in the room today just to protect ourselves. And obviously, we've vaccinated the people that have just chosen to get the vaccine. Is it's been a very good mitigation step as well. So I agree with what Joel said. 
And our next question is from Ben Ayanata at Aerospace America. Hi, this would be for John Vollmer, I, I think. Um, the peer review process, I hope I got that term correct that you referenced earlier, is that um, a process that's going to be sustainable, something you'll do for, you know, all future missions or something you would streamline? And did that bring extra uh, cost with it in terms of uh, personnel? Yeah, so to answer your question, it is a process that we will continue to do. Um, we've baselined it into our system, and, we, and it, actually we've not only baselined it, we've automated it. So um, it is something we'll continue to do. Uh, it does require additional discipline. Uh, we did not necessarily bring on additional um, staff to do that. It was um, an expected part of their responsibilities, so it was more of a coordination and uh, completing the coordination than it was um, extra work, if you will. Thank you. And our final question is from Irene Klotz at Aviation Week. Thanks, Josh. Um, I have a couple of related questions about Soyuz. Probably um, for Kathy, the last time we spoke, the proposal for the barter seats on commercial crew for Soyuz was at the State Department. Um, has anything progressed uh, these last few months? And also, until Boeing is flying Starliner, you're still in the same position that you were back in February when you put out that other solicitation and got the seat on the um, MS-18 flight. So what are you planning on doing um, until Starliner is ready for crew transport? Thanks. Sorry, this is Joel. I'll, I'll start, and then Kathy can add. Um, that agreement is out of the State Department. Uh, it's the authority is, is in NASA's hands, and we've started that work with uh, Roscosmos. Um, we've gotten the initial comments, and we're going through the process where we go back and forth, where they ask questions, we update, we send back, and then in parallel, they'll be submitting to their government for approval. So uh, that process is, is moving positively, and, and we're excited to go see that. Um, and so from, um, you know, as far as ISS operations today, um, as you've probably heard, uh, Roscosmos is working to fly uh, what they call a movie mission, fly an actress and a producer on the October Soyuz. Um, with that plan in place, um, Mark Van de Heij and one of his uh, cosmonaut colleagues, uh, Piotr uh, Dubroff, would stay up there for a year, and so um, we would have that contingency plan. But uh, you know, we still have the plan where uh, Crew 3 launches uh, while Crew 2 is up there, but if for some reason we had some challenges, um, we do have coverage for the next few months. Thanks. All right, and then we'll go to Kathy. So like I was saying at the very beginning, you know, today really is a culmination of a ton of work from this team, not just over the last 18 months, but years. Um, we talked a little bit about the work that really was started 10 years ago for us to get ready. And so we need to keep going. This team's going to keep going. They're going to take it one step at a time. We've got some important work that we need to be doing over the this next eight days to get ready for the launch. We're going to get through the launch, we're going to get through on-orbit operations, and we're going to get this vehicle down. And then you guys can all start bugging Steve Sitch again about <laughs> what's the CFT and John Vollmer about what's the CFT launch date. Um, but we're going to do this one step at a time because we're going to do it right. And, um, you know, we've got the crew's lives in our hands, and everybody sitting here today understood that we have the crew's lives in our hands. And this is an important demonstration for us to buy down part of that risk before we go put crew on these vehicles. So put on your seatbelt, get ready to go. This is going to be an exciting year for the Starliner team. As you guys have already seen, it's been an exciting year for Joel and Steve already, and many more to come. So I don't know who was talking about, you know, that they're getting worried about all the missions we have coming, but our job right now is to keep them coming and keep you all as busy as possible. So um, 
I think we're doing a good job of that right now. Thank you all very much for being here today, having interest in this, and uh, we're going to have an exciting couple weeks to come. So um, keep paying attention. Thank you. And that's going to wrap things up for us here tonight. NASA and Boeing's Orbital Flight Test 2 is targeting a launch to the space station at 2.53 p.m. Friday, July 30th from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. We'll have live launch coverage starting at 2 p.m. Next week, we'll have more to come on this important mission, so follow us online, social media, and NASA television. Learn more about this important mission at nasa.gov slash commercial crew. Have a good evening. <laughs>